Yes, welcome to Last Call. I'm Dean. That's the ultimate kiss up, Mike. I'm oh, in the studio. You really said something good about the Lions, so you're feeling strong about yourself. I'm in the studio. Mike is at the beach, and uh, and we're here. I want to know though, and I appreciate the Ravens Twitter account tweeting out that Des caught it, but all I see is his hand on the football. I want to see the rest of the play to make sure he caught it, because you know I'm an expert at anything Des related to catches. So that's all I'm saying. Mike, what do we got on the show today? We got a lot to look at. We got to spend some time with the Dolphins and the Bengals. How about that five guys ejected from the game in two different plays? We're going to talk about the end of the Atlanta New Orleans game with the clock running down to one second, but you couldn't put it back on. And Tyree Kill makes an unbelievable catch that nobody knew was a catch. Al Michaels might have been the first one that recognized it was a catch. But I think let's first talk about the game that you had this afternoon when you got the Steelers and the Washington Football Club. Didn't get to see it here in uh, Southern California, not because I was on the beach. It's because it was a regional game. But controversy surrounding the end of the first half on the field goal, which was Washington's first points on the board. Tell us about that. Yeah, not a national game, but it was aired in the New York metro area. So my mom did get to see it. So that's a plus. Really crazy ending at the first half. Washington out of timeouts. Alex Smith gets sacked. It's third down going to fourth down. They're in field goal range. So now they have to run the field goal unit out onto the field. And for some reason, the game clock stops. And referee John Hussey gets on the microphone and announces that because there was an issue with the K-ball, um, the game clock was stopped. They basically reset everything, and they were going to wind it on his ready for play. Well, in that situation, with the offense out of timeouts, a hurry up, basically a hurricane field goal um, attempt to get everybody out there, we don't normally want our officials to go get a K ball like they normally would with 12 minutes to go in the third quarter. Just get the football, put it down, make sure everybody's lined up and let them go. Well, the problem is Alex Smith took the football with him to the sideline and that caused the delay. And now the officials were, were trying to get a football in referee stopped the, the game clock and, uh, and, and Washington did benefit from the whole situation. Now, look, when Smith was down, there was roughly 16 seconds. So it's not like they didn't have an opportunity, even if the clock doesn't stop. Typically, 16, 17 seconds is where, is where teams practice that to get the field goal team out. Um, it's interesting, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, Mike. I mean, have you ever seen that? And what do you do in that situation? Is it delay of game on Washington? Do you stop the clock? Is it a 10 second runoff? A lot of things to consider here. Well, I don't think you stop the clock. And when I listened to John Hussey's announcement, he said there was no kicking ball in the area. Well, who cares? Get the first ball available and run it out on the field. And Alex Smith carried the ball off the field. So he put himself and the Washington football club in jeopardy so to me, you grab the first ball and put it down. But to me, to stop the clock, you have to do everything you can not to stop the clock in that situation. Because, yeah, I understand the hurricane thing is about 16, 17 seconds, and it would have been real close. But, boy, you look at that, that three points at the end of that half, which really kind of turned things around, it seemed to me, for Washington. And I think it is grab the first ball, run it in, put it down, and if they don't get it off in time, tough luck. It's their fault for running the ball off the field in the first place. So you get the first ball, put it down. If time runs out, so be it, it's over. That's, that's what I think, at least based on John Hussey's announcement that there was no kicking ball in the area. The hell with the kicking ball. Just get a regular ball in. Yeah, you want to play. Typically, you want the football that they're using because you don't want to waste time, like you said. And normally, and we've seen players do that, they know they get the ball to the official. And if you watch, the umpire is signaling the Smith to give him the football, in, and Alex just keeps going. This is my football. I'm taking it to the sideline. And, and like you said, Mike, I agree, and we've always taught our game officials in that situation, we last last resort stop the clock. You want to try to get a football down. If you have to get it from the sideline, get it in as quickly as possible. And unless there's something mechanical breakdown where maybe the umpire drops the football, maybe if there's a delay caused by the officials, now 
Now you have to stop the clock. But that's not the case here. And, and it was, um, again, Washington did benefit from the situation. But let's, let's shift gears. Let's go to a game. Um, Cincinnati-Miami, I can't remember a game that has had five ejections in it, you know, other than maybe years ago with a all-out brawl. Five ejections. Let's talk about a situation um, in, on a punt play where you had fouls called during the play, and then after the play, both teams get into it, coaches involved. What happened here, Mike? Well, it, it's really kind of the sec. The actual play was the second time Mike Thomas had hit the receiver of a punt and hit him early. So obviously with that second shot, which was worse than the first one, you know, tempers flared. And you never really see on TV when it starts because – as it ends up, Miami recovers the muffed ball and advances toward the sideline. And then this fight breaks out. And like you say, I, I, I can't remember five. Um, and here there was three thrown out on this particular play. And, and probably when you get a big fight scene like that, there was probably more that could have been thrown out, actually. But, you know, the, the Miami, it was like, OK, I've had enough. And uh, they went all the way across the field, you know, to take on the, um, the Bengals. And, and um, there are situations, obviously, we're going to be dealing with a lot of fines here, Dean. And in your time there, you worked in discipline. Even when I was uh, overseeing the department, you were kind of the head of discipline. You and Gene Washington put together specific rules for actually fighting, then leaving the team area and becoming actively involved in a fight or inactively or just standing around but still entering in the area, are they going to look at that likely in this, in this situation in the league? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, they'll obviously study every angle available and look at all the participants, and then I'm sure there will be a list of fines uh, from, from this altercation. And going back to, to when I started at the NFL and I was working with Gene Washington, who was a, a, an all-pro receiver uh, in the league for a long time and then was in charge of discipline, um, there were more fights and altercations at that time like this. We haven't seen this very much in recent years. And, and the league did put in strict guidelines. Hey, if there's a fight, you have to remove yourself from the fight area. Even if you're not participating, you're going to get fined if you don't get out. Even as a peacemaker, they did not want these types of situations to escalate. And obviously, we saw that. And this thing, this took from the end of the play to the announcement, it was over 10 minutes to sort this thing out. That's how long it took. You had multiple fouls during the down, then multiple flags after the play, three players ejected, two from Miami, one from Cincinnati, and and all of that, and you know what the enforcement was? Yeah. Offsetting fouls, we're going to replay the down after all of that. But it is, it's an ugly situation. Obviously, it's something we, you know, we don't want to see in the league. And again, like you said, um, this will be looked at during the week and there will be additional discipline, no question. And I think what they're going to look at too and what they'll be upset about is it, it, it is the responsibility of the team to keep their team on the sideline. I mean, you have a multitude of coaches and, and you even have, you know, get back coaches. They're called to keep the coaches off out of the white area. And, and I'm sure that the league's not going to look kindly about the back. Look, I get it. I mean, I could say that Michael Thomas's shot was a cheap shot, especially the second one. But still, in some way, you can't let your team, if you're the Dolphins, you can't let the entire team come all the way across the field. And then earlier in the game, there were there were two other ejections, and this was this was Xavier Howard and Tyler Boyd, and this was an altercation. And what's interesting about this is initially the officials broke it up. There was a late flag. The flag was on Boyd, and then New York got involved. And after further discussion, both Boyd and Howard were ejected for throwing punches and I'm putting that in in air quotes because to me neither guy threw punches I certainly don't think there was enough to eject but that was the ultimate decision um, there was some open hand you know what we like to call chicken fighting um, and they ejected both players but what was interesting about this is because the officials threw the flag initially New York can come in and look at any action associated with that flag. And they decided that Howard had to go in addition to Boyd. But because New York created the ejection, 
only the flag that was thrown on the field was enforced. So you had two players ejected, which would normally offset, and only Cincinnati was penalized 15 yards, which to me doesn't seem fair. And I think the league certainly needs to look at that, that if New York gets involved and adds an ejection, there has to be some consideration for penalty yardage because if what he did was, was an ejectable offense, then, then the team shouldn't get off without the yardage. Yeah, and, and you know, your point about the first one taking 10 minutes, you know, that's part of the reason why, because New York is involved in that. And so you've got that conversation from New York, you know, going between the referee and Al Riveron, and they're looking at things, and that's why it takes so long. And I, I think from the officiating standpoint here, too, you know, sometimes games just get so hard to keep under control, especially when there's shots like that, that the Michael Thomas types hits on the on the defenseless receiver of the punt. And and I, and I think sometimes maybe maybe even in replay, you tend to overreact a little bit to try to get it in control. Um, and I know it was earlier, but that game seemed to be really mouthy right from the get go don't know why because the Dolphins and the Bengals don't strike me as one of these heated rivalries you know like the you know the Steelers and the Ravens or though but yeah it is now well now no kidding it's gonna be and and um but yeah it was uh, five players ended up being ejected and boy get that ball but get that kicking ball out there. oh no wrong game yeah right wrong game but let's let's go to a game, your game actually, and this was this was New Orleans and Atlanta. End of the game, hail mary attempt by Matt Ryan. Clock expires. There's there's maybe a second. What happened at the end of the game there? Well, there was a second left. So it's a first and ten play. Throws a deep ball, hail mary into the end zone. Ball bounces around, bounces around, bounces around, hits the ground. And the question was, was there time left on the clock? The officials on the field, they let the clock run to zero. Didn't stop with one or two seconds to go. You look at the replay and you can see that the ball hit the ground with one second to go. Now, in college, you could actually put one second back on the clock and Matt Ryan would have got one other chance to throw a Hail Mary. But in the NFL, when this rule was put in to allow replay, to correct this clock if, in fact, uh, the time shouldn't have run out at the end of the game or a half, the basic scenario was that it had to be two seconds or more, which I think, honestly, is ridiculous. Um, you know, And I get the theory, Dean, and maybe you can clean up the theory a little bit better, but you know, to say you can't put on one, you can't put one second back on, you can see by the tweets, it makes no sense to anybody. But the way they arrived at two seconds, Dean, explain that. Yeah, so I was a part of those discussions, and this rule went in 2015, and it had been put in for the playoffs, and there was there was a college Big 12 championship game involving Texas that kind of started this whole thing with putting time back on the clock at the end of a game. And, and here's where the discussion went. Everybody understood that if there was time remaining and and clock the clock did expire, but when the play should have ended, the ball hit the ground or the knee was down or the runner was out of bounds, we needed to put in a mechanism to fix that. But where the committee went, they where replay really started is an obvious mistake. So what is an obvious timing area? When you think about mechanically how the game is timed for 59 minutes and 59 seconds, right? You have an official that recognizes the play is over. The official will rule on that, whether it's incomplete or kill the clock. And then the clock operator will recognize that signal and will stop the clock. So there's a built-in delay. It's not a four or five second delay, but maybe it's, maybe it's a second. So what the committee felt is that if you're, if you're putting one second on the clock at the end of the game in that situation, are we correcting the obvious error or and we're not allowing for the normal timing mechanism? So that's why the committee landed on two. And I understand that. But we knew at the time and we said it. We said there's going to be a play where there's one second left and people are not going to understand 
why you can't put the one second on. So I see both sides. I get it from a timing thing. We don't look at an NFL clock, unlike the NBA. We don't see tenths of a second. So we don't know if that is truly a mistake or if time would have expired. That's why we went to two. Um, but I also get the visual image of one second on the clock when the ball hits the ground. Why don't we give uh, the team a, another snap? So it'll be interesting. I'm sure the committee will discuss this going forward. But right now, that's the rule. An obvious mistake is two or more seconds. It's just not consistent. I mean, how many times have we heard in replay, you know, when the clock's at 7-12 and there's a decision that's made, reset the clock to 7-13. Sure, now, that happens. One second there. But then you go game on the line on the last play of the half or the last play of the game. And yeah, people, how about people in Nebraska? It was Nebraska against Texas, by the way, that uh, got that one second put on and Texas kind of kicked the field goal, eventually won the game, maybe in overtime. But to me, I mean, that, that's like, if that happens in the Super Bowl, Dean, I mean, there would be such incredible out rage and and i don't blame it at all i think that was a horrible rule. but just just remember now we we've, we've got to maintain and you've talked about this and you've railed about this on this show about getting too technical in replay and so again we have to make sure that we stick to is it clear and obvious and and that's what the discussion was in this situation one second may not be a clear and obvious timing mistake everybody might have done everything correctly and because it's at the end of the game, we're treating it differently than the other 59 minutes, 50, 58 seconds. But I get your point. I understand. But, but as usual, I'm right. So let's move on. Where, where, where are we going next? Right. You should have changed that rule when you were in there. That wasn't my rule, by the way. Hey, Tyreek Hill made a catch, by the way. I mean, nobody, nobody knew that he had caught that ball. I don't think he didn't even have any idea. Tell us about that. Tell us what, what could have been done there. Yeah, Tyreek Hill was involved in a couple of interesting situations. I wish I could do backflips like him. But this was a play in the end zone, ruled incomplete on the field. It was outside two minutes, and it was not ruled a score. So this is a coach's challenge only. And Tyreek Hill goes to the ground. The ball bounces up. He does eventually catch it. But in his mind, and you could tell, he never thought. He thought that ball had hit the ground. He got up put the ball down, ran back to the sideline. Kansas City, the replays that were shown initially didn't show the ball not hitting the ground. It was third down going to fourth. Kansas City lined up to punt. They punted the football. And the next thing you, we see is this look where the ball never touches the ground. And the reaction on the sideline between Tyreek Hill and Andy Reid was priceless. Andy looked as dumbfounded as everybody else, and, and Tyreek looked up at the video board, and you could tell a light bulb went off for him. But guess what? We ran another play. We had another snap. Can't go back. And this kind of leads me to the discussion when we put in the automatic scoring play and turnover, turnover review. There was some discussion about putting the potential scoring play, making that automatically reviewable. Ultimately, the committee didn't want to go that far because where do you draw the line? If the runner's down at the one, the two, what's a potential scoring play? Um, so ultimately, it's still a challengeable play, um, not an automatic review, but really interesting and just some, some funny moments that uh, you know didn't cost the Chiefs the game, thankfully for them and their fans, but uh, it was an interesting situation. Even Bondo, our executive director, is probably – probably he doesn't even realize that I forgot to ask about the opening call. No, that, no, I got that. Don't worry. You talk, and then I'm going to – I'll get that. Don't worry. And Because he's watching Buffalo, who's going into score now, and just did score to take a 13-7 lead. But let, let's go – let's call him the closing call. Because exactly. Because we got football on Monday. We got football on Tuesday. The closing – the closing got, comment. Got, exactly. The closing comment. Almost the closing comment. Um. You go ahead. Let's hear your closing comments first. Yeah, so my closing thought, comment of the week, um, you know, a little bit over a week ago, we saw a video that went viral. High school referee in Texas, Fred Garcia, um, ejected a player from a game, made the announcement, and then the player, Emmanuel Duran, um, came back out onto the field and, and hit the referee. Um, the referee was down, was evaluated for a concussion, and the video, like I said, went viral. 
And, and it was the reaction to the video that just got me thinking. And there were people that were outraged, rightfully so. Um, Duran was, was, was ejected. Um, he's being looked at. Look, I'm all for second chances. I don't want this young man. I don't want this to stick with him and hurt him going forward. But it was the reaction from some people, especially on social media, that, well, I, like I said, some people were outraged, but others, um, the jokes, uh, the, the comments, the official probably deserved it. The call was bad. All of these things. And it just kind of, it's an underlying theme with game officials for all sports at all levels is that sometimes we don't see them as human beings. And we see the striped jersey and, and we forget that that's a person. And that's a person with a family. That's a person with feelings. And it's not someone that you can run out and physically assault and that that's okay. And I think, you know, the right thing was done. The school district did, uh, you know, the team Edinburgh high school did win the game and they basically forfeited the rest of the, the playoffs. They, they were out of the playoffs. They can't continue, which I think was the decisive and the right thing to do, but it just made me kind of just reemphasize the whole idea that we have to do a better job of humanizing our officials because when you have, especially young people that go out and now, and I don't think this isn't a dramatic statement, but that go out and in this current environment, in a pandemic, risk their lives to officiate games so young people can play, we have to recognize that and recognize that they're human beings and we have to treat them that way with respect. And I was never a game official. I never officiated on the field. I started as an intern in the NFL office and this community took me in as one of their own. And I'll never forget that this community is an amazing community, but it was just this video that went viral and some of the comments and reaction to it, it just, it, it made me sad and made me sad about where we are today, especially as people view game officials. And, and, and really mine was going to be in the same vein. You know, I, I'm like concerned with basically the safety of amateur officials anymore. I mean, we get, listen, the NFL, you get a lot of safety. Major college, you get a lot of protection and stuff. You don't in lower levels. And to me, I don't want this kid to have a second chance. I mean, he's done in my book, the hell with him. I mean, he was suspended last year for attacking a referee in a soccer game and kicked off the soccer team. So at what point do we say give second chances? I mean, these people that, as you say, social media made me irate. These people that make jokes about it and criticize them, they, they, they don't have the guts to step on a field and do it themselves. They're chicken. They hide behind a screen and they, they make these preposterous statements about officials who are doing a thankless job. And to me, all states, now it's a class A, uh, class a assault charge in Texas, as it should be. Remember, Robert Watts got run over by a player intentionally. I think it was three years ago, maybe four. Um, this should be a felony. And they are looking at all states. The National Association of Sports Officials is always working with legislation, trying to protect officials. And they do need to protect it. Because if you see this, and we all know that we have a shortage of officials all around the country. If you see this, if you're a person that, well, maybe I'll officiate. And then you see something like this, you're gonna officiate? Why should I? Why should I take the abuse? It's about time that we give a little respect to a group of people that have the guts to try to do something that is almost impossible to do and have the wherewithal and the strength to really stomach the abuse that they get. So I, I'm obviously horrified by this and, and, um, and I hope that kid never plays it down at football or any sport for the rest of his life, quite frankly. Um, now with you, different story. I mean, I, I believe you, you deserve second chance. You know, Thank you, I appreciate we were, that. We were very worried about you um, last week. We were very worried about, I think we can play a little clip as a matter. Yeah, of let's do it. It was by Southern California standards, a little chilly last night. So I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm gonna start a fire. Well, as soon as I lit that thing, it blew up in my face. And I burned, and if you know me, how, how, how sensitive I am about my hair, I burned some of my hair in the side of my face. You can't see it because I've been applying aloe all night and all day, but I lost some hair last night and I'm very upset about it. 
And we had people see now this we got we we just we want you to know that Dean is fine. I mean Dean's a, Dean is fine. Everybody's fine. We've got to be a little upset of what he did to his house a little bit. Thank God there wasn't a lot of damage. But we wanted everybody to know, right, that you're here. You are a week. I am. You know, I'm you, a trooper. I'm per perfectly fine. And let me tell you, the love on social media that I didn't get was amazing. It, it's just the people, the outpouring of hatred that I continue to get on a week by week basis. No one took into consideration. That I almost burned a couple of hair follicles. So I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Twitter. Thank you. Well, that's about it, huh, Dean? That's for it. That's last call. He's Mike. I'm Dean. Check us out Thursday night football, Rams, Patriots, and, uh, and we'll see you next week. Thursday night football on Fox. These guys are ready. The playoff race is in full swing. Cam Newton looks to keep New England's postseason streak alive. Touchdown, Patriots. But Aaron Donald and L.A. are out to secure their place in the playoffs. He's got it. Touchdown, Rams. Patriots. Rams, Thursday Night Football on Fox, NFL Network, and streaming on Prime Video.